Hello everybody, it's Julie, Kansas City Girl in a Colorado World, and today is July 1st. It is a Wednesday, and I thought I would film a mid-year progress report, a mid-year update. I'm not the only one who, who had this idea. I've already noticed a couple of videos pop up earlier this morning. Um, Abby Bella Stitch and... Oh, Jen Stitchy Niche, I think I've seen already this morning, had uh, posted um, what they've done this year. So great minds think alike. Um, I wanted to show you guys all of my finishes, my cross stitch finishes, since January 1st. Um, so halfway through the year, this is what I've accomplished. I have finished 26 things. 26. That is, I believe that's more than I've ever even finished in previous years, like in the whole year. Now, some of these were smaller things. So that of course inflates the numbers. Um, I have quite a few smalls in here, but I've got some decent sized projects as well. And I think that, um, I'm more, I think I'm making a lot more progress for a few reasons. I do believe I am a, a faster stitcher now, um, just experience and practice. I think I, I'm stitching a little faster. I'm not doing anything differently. I'm just faster at it. Um, also, you know, some of these were whips from 2017, 2018, 2019. Um, so, you know, they're kind of like snowball effect, like cumulative years of stitching on them and finally closing in on a finish. And um, I've had a little more stitching time this year, I think, with um, the pandemic and, and reduced hours at work and slowdowns, um, not going out as much. So probably just more stitching time as well. But um, I've got a lot done. I'm very happy with how much I've accomplished in six months. And I'm really excited to see what I've accomplished by the end of the year. So I'm going to show you all of my finishes and um, this will hopefully not be a terribly long video because I'm not going to, this isn't going to be like a regular floss tube with haul and all that stuff. Um, however, I also want to do um, a little mid-year book wrap up. So um, the latter half of this video will be about books I've read this year that I really, really loved. And if you're not interested in hearing the book talk, of course, you are free to skip out after the stitching. Um, I have read 34 books this year, and I picked all of the books that I've given a five star rating on Goodreads to talk about. So this video could get kind of long because there's a bunch of books at the end, but I'm going to try to be quick. So anyway, let's talk about stitching first. Um, so I keep a little, I have a, um, a lot of happy planner stuff. Um, this is a happy planner notebook and I keep a list of all of my cross stitch stuff. So I have a list of my whips. Um, organized chronologically. There's a lot of them. It's only 92 right now. It's fine. Um, and, and then I have, I keep a list of my finishes. Um, as I finish things, I cross them off my whip list and I record them. So those are my finishes for 2020. So um, I do write down the date I finished them. So I have that info as well. So the very first thing I finished this year was um, on January 5th, but this was a project that I started around Thanksgiving, so November of 2019. This is, I don't know if I can say it's my favorite finish, but it's, it's up there. Um, this is Long Awaited Letter by an Etsy seller uh, called Cute Patterns by Maria. And I, I stitched this on 28 count Monaco that I dyed myself. And then I just used all of the called for DMC. Um, Cute Patterns by Maria is one of those Russian designers that I absolutely love because they just, the detail that they can get, it's insane. The detail they can get in a pattern. Um, 
with the back stitch and the blends and you know it's just it's beautiful and then I finished it as a stand-up and this trim this pom-pom trim is from Nikki's creations she has awesome pom-pom trim in really great colors and this color has it's so versatile like I it kind of just matches almost everything so I love that trim and I had to buy a bunch more when I saw her in February um so yeah that's cute patterns by Maria letter long awaited letter um I do want to just point out on this pattern I did not stitch the bottom it's actually um I think I did more than half but maybe I did two-thirds of it um, but there was more of the owl's body and I I got that far and I thought that certainly looks good enough for me <laughs> so um, okay so my next finish I'm gonna have to drop in a picture because it was a um, smalls exchange for the stitchers coming on Facebook so um, it was for it was Valentine's Day. Um, it was called, I think it was called the, it was the love spell exchange. So I stitched this and finished this on January 12th and it's, um, living with its recipient now, but I have a picture of course. So I will drop that in right here. So I stitched this on, I believe it was um, a uh, Fiberlicious um, 36 count. Um, it was an exclusive color for Stitchy Box. And it was um, really, 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 really hard to stitch on. I don't mind stitching on small count fabric and I don't mind stitching on dark fabric, but that one I just, I. I struggled. I missed some holes. There's some X's that are a little wonky. Um, it worked in the end, but um, it, it was diff it was a difficult fabric. <laughs> um, I stitched it with, I believe, all of the called for DMCs, which were just a couple of colors. And the pattern is called um, Coffin, and it's from Etsy, and the seller is called White Raven. And... I almost like want to stitch it for myself because I really love it, but it's not mine anymore. So, um, okay. So up next I finish a Mill Hill. I finished the Haunted Library Mill Hill Buttons and Beads. So these are the bigger Mill Hills. They're about, I believe they're about, um, I can't remember now 60 no 70 they're 70 by 70 square so they're decent size and they're essentially full coverage and um, I started this in January for um, my 13th um, Amy and I are stitching Halloween stuff on the 13th of every month and I just couldn't put this down I couldn't stop so I just worked on it like intensely until it was done um, this, I am calling this a finish. However, my plan is to stitch nine of these Mill Hill Halloween themed buildings on one piece of fabric and have a whole Halloween village. But I'm going to count each one as a finish because that is a ton of stitching and beading. I stitched this on some fabric I dyed myself. So this is a, I believe a 32 count linen and I writ dyed it and it came out just exactly what I wanted. Oh, it's so good. Isn't that good? That's really, it was just, just what I wanted. Um, so here's Haunted Library. A ton of beads on that thing. <laughs> um, so it's a finish, but it's also sort of a whip still. Okay, the next thing I finished was um, an old whip. So this was one where I had had about a fourth of it done and I finally was like, I just need to finish that. I could finish it with like two days of stitching. This is a pattern from Good Morning Maui on Etsy and it's called Golden Girls. 
it's this uh, called for DMC, but I dyed this 14 count Ada myself. This is one of my very first adventures into dyeing my own fabric. Um, and then I just framed it in a simple five by seven frame. So it came out really super cute. Um, after that, oh, so I finished that. I can't read this from that far away. <laughs> I finished, um, so I finished the Mill Hill on uh, February 20th. I started it on February 13th. So I worked on it for a week straight and finished it. Uh, I finished the Good Golden Girls on February 25th. And then on March 2nd, I finished um, a class piece. So I went and took a class with Nikki's Creations on February 29th on Leap Day. It was right before COVID kind of started to shut things down. Um, Nikki taught this class and I uh, got a good start at the class. And then I went home and finished the stitching um, just a couple of days later. So this was called a uh, French pouch. And this is, this was a kit for the class. This is Nikki's linen. I love her linen. This is a 28 count. She calls it Vichy or Vichy linen. You can get it on her Etsy. Um, and she like over dyes it with tea and coffee, I believe. Um, stitched with DMC, called for DMC. Um, we also stitched this little pin cushion here and attached it. Um, I made one little change. This, uh, both of these girls had the same skin tone and I chose a darker floss um, to make this one a little different and to just have a little more diversity in my stitching. And what is super cool about this class um, is she teaches you how to make this pouch, which closes up into a cute little pouch. However, I leave it kind of just open um, and it's really super cute on my tabletop because um, you can still see down and see the stitching um, and it kind of just sits like this and it's just adorable. So that was another finish. After that, I did um, another, I think I was feeling really confident about how to bead mill hills after that point. So I started, I started grabbing old mill hills. Um, so I finished this mill hill love coffee. Actually, I can't remember if I had the stitching done and I just needed to do the beading. It's a really small mill hill, as you can see. But I got that finished in March, the very end of March, March 30th. And then I finished my first pattern, my first, um, yeah, the first thing I designed. So if you watched my last video, you know that I stitched a trio of houses. Um, I'm calling them Nantucket or Christmas in Nantucket. Um, but this was the first one that I stitched and I stitched this back in April. So I've, or I, I stitched it in March. I finished it on April 1st. Um, so this is the first house, uh, Christmas in Nantucket, and I'm calling this one Cherry Street. Um, I do want to just emphasize, um, I named all of these houses after streets in Nantucket. So there's Cherry Street, there's, um, Orange Street. And then there's Keats Street. Um, but I do want to say these three houses are based on actual houses in Nantucket, but they are not on those streets. So I don't know if anyone out there knows Nantucket really well and they're like, that house is not on Cherry Street, that's on 10th Street, um, you are probably correct. <laughs> so this was um, my first house that I finished. I stitched this on a 32 count natural linen and um, I stitched it mostly with DMC except for the blue in the house is Weeks Dye Works Shepherd's Blue. These patterns are available for free on my Gumroad website. 
I will link it below if you would like to go grab them. I will show you the other two houses in a minute, but I finished some things in between. So I'm going in order here. The next thing I finished was Witchy Stitcher Witchcrafts on April 3rd. I finished this and this I also really love how it came out. Um, this I stitched on 28 count crystal flapper from Picture This Plus. So it's got some sparkle and I stitched it with all of the called for DMCs. Um, she released this pattern showing it, I think on like a tea dyed kind of fabric and on a gray fabric. Um, I sat down to pull fabric for it and I, I this, I had a piece of this flapper and it kind of, I was like, that might, that could possibly work. Um, and I'm, and it did, and I love it. And I think it turned out great. Um, I also finished this as a flat fold and I put some fun fabric on the back. And I love that. That was definitely one of my favorite finishes. After that, I uh, finished some primitive hair patterns. Um, so this was a series of four smalls um, called Witches Shadows. And I counted all four of them as one finish because they were released as one pattern inten intended to stitch all four as a set. I'm, so what I'm getting at is I'm not calling this four finishes. I'm calling this one finish. So, um, but there are four pieces of it. So um, this is also linen I dyed myself. I didn't realize how much of this is linen I've dyed. Um, this is probably by far my favorite linen I've ever dyed. It just came out so amazing. It's purple and pink and a little like bluish too. These patterns just call for white and black floss. I use DMC A12, so I don't know if you're picking up any sparkle, but it's very subtle if you are. And there's, um, which is Shadows, which I finished on April 4th. I was on a roll at that point with finishes because I had finished my Mill Hill on a on March 30th I finished um, my house on April 1st I finished witchcrafts on April 3rd and then I finished witches shadows on April 4th <laughs> and then on April 6th I had a huge finish a huge my biggest finish ever probably you know her you love her I finished Mirabilia Snow Queen she is stitched on 32 count Polywog Princess by a hand dyed by Stephanie Fabrics with all the called for colors and beads. Um, oh, except for I converted her hair on, um, she's a blonde on the pattern and I made her a redhead. I'll zoom in so you can see that. Um, I still haven't framed her yet because I haven't been able to go look for frames because uh, quarantine. <laughs> So she's one of my few finishes that isn't fully finished. Um, she turned out just so fabulous. So huge, amazing finish. And then on also around um, that week in April, like the first week or two of April, I got out some Mill Hill Santas and finished them off. So. Um, I had two of these, I had the DMC done, but I hadn't beaded them. And then the third Santa, I didn't even have that much of the DMC done. I had like a little start. Um, so on that Santa, I actually had to finish all the DMC and beat him. Uh, but it's the Mill Hill Renaissance Santas. So I have a Venice Santa. I have Genoa Santa. And I have Florence Santa. I think Florence was the one I needed to do the stitching still. I, I, I don't remember. So two of them just needed beads and one of them needed stitching and beads. So I finally finished those guys up. 
And then April 13th, I finished Little House Needleworks, The Bookshelf. And I really love how this came out. I stitched this on 36 count Winter's Moon um, linen from Lakeside Linens. The floss, um, the chart calls for DMC and I subbed um, mostly gentle arts. So I had a whole bunch of limited edition gentle arts from Stitchy Box and they're still there actually. You can still get them from Stitchy Box. Um, she restocks. They are limited edition gentle arts that you can only get at Stitchy Box, but um, they're, I thought they were like, I bought them a couple years back and I thought, that was the end of them, but actually she's restocked them and I just bought a whole bunch more. Um, so just some really beautiful gentle arts, a couple of classic, classic color works, but essentially just whatever the called for DMC was, I pulled that and then I pulled a fancy floss that was close. Um, and it just like the variegation to give it a little more dimension. Um, the DMC on the model looked a little flat to me. I'm really happy with how this turned out. I did make a change on the authors. I think all I did was I changed, this was supposed to be Laura Ingalls Wilder and I just left the R out and made it Oscar Wilde because I felt like it. <laughs> um, okay, so after that, I finished, oh, we started Mania. So um, I finished Blackbird Designs Summer Flocks, which was in the Sewing Club book. And this only took me one day to stitch. This super tiny, cute little, cute little stitch. Stitched up really fast. This is on 30 count Old England linen from Nikki's Creations. And um, I used, I used essentially the called for colors if I had most of the weeks and if I didn't, I pulled something that looked identical or as close to. So there is Summer Phlox. I finished it as just a cute little pillow with some fun trim. And then I finished another pattern from... Mm, no, I lied. I finished my second house, my second Christmas in Nantucket house. This is Orange Street. Um, I don't know if I showed you on the first one how I finished these as flat folds. They're all three finished the same. This beautiful Christmas fabric on the back, um, a red and green Christmassy plaid on the inside, and then a dark brown homespun check on the front. Um, so this is house, the second house. Um, it is stitched with Confederate gray for the house um, from Weeks Dye Works and Classic Color Works Balsam Fur for the tree and the greenery. Um, and everything else is DMC. Again, you can get this for free. Just look at the link below if you'd like to go check that out. Um, and then I stitched another sewing club pattern from Blackbird Designs. And I stitched um, in my garden and I have sent that off to my mother for Mother's Day and she absolutely loved it. My mom's favorite, favorite, favorite things to do, read like me, and she likes to read the same genres as me. She loves um, sci-fi and fantasy and she loves romance. Um, and then her other favorite thing to do is garden. And she has absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal gardens, um, floral gardens. My dad does like vegetable garden. Um, my mom has like, in, she has such a green thumb. She has insane rose bushes and flower beds like lining the yard. She just, she does a lot of landscaping and it's always just looks absolutely amazing.
Um, so I stitched from Sewing Club, I stitched in my garden for my mother and I will drop a picture in here. So I stitched this on 36 count picture this plus in ale and I used essentially the called for colors just like summer flocks if I didn't have the exact color I picked something that was nearly identical so um, it came out really really well I finished it on um, a wooden board which I think I got from Target at the dollar day spot and um, it was maybe three bucks and it's it was just the perfect size absolutely perfect i love how that turned out so after that i stitched another sewing club um, pattern and this one i did keep for myself um, this is called garden friends sewing bag however i did not finish it as a sewing bag i finished this as a cute little pillow it says hollyhocks down here at the bottom um, I backed it with some cute little floral and I um, trimmed it with this beautiful like foresty brown green. So um, this is a 40 count x design uh, linen. It's called Grandma's Slip. And the trim is from Dames of the Needle. I think it's called Colonial Tea. That could be wrong. It's from Dames of the Needle at any rate. I love the way this pillow turned out. It's absolutely perfect. So after that, I finished. Um, this was a really quick finish. I almost felt bad like writing it down and calling it a finish. Um, but this is I actually sent this off to a friend, um, but I will insert a picture here. This was Little House Needleworks ABCs, um, the original one, not like the summer or the winter. It's just called ABCs. And as you can see, I didn't do the whole alphabet. I just did the top part. And I had, um, I had most of that done. Um, and so I kind of just, I just realized I was never going to finish it. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to finish off the C and finish off the border and just make it a cute little pillow. Um, so that's what I did. I believe the fabric is a 32 count summer khaki by Witchelt, just a really simple um, fabric. And the flosses are the called for, which I think were all classic color works that were called for on the chart. And then the um, trim, I think was just from Joann's. Um, so, I think the rest of these are in my possession. I don't have to drop in any more pictures. Um, so my next finish was on May 31st, very end of mania. I finished Feels Like Home from Fat Quarter Shop. I finished, um, I used all the called for classic color works for this. And um, I did use the called for 25 count Lugana However, I stitched it over one instead of over two. So mine was, um, look how little it turned out. It's like six inches by six inches. So itty bitty, or actually I think it's, might be five inches. I don't know. Um, but all the called for floss. And um, I think that turned out pretty cute. It is actually, um, it was more stitching than it looked like the house took forever and then I once I was done with the house I thought I was just gonna like knock it out so quick but that fence took forever too uh, but it turned out really cute uh, after that I finished my other stitch along that I had been working on and working on I finished um, the feels like home no that was feels like home I just showed you um, I finished uh, Prim Village from Be In My Bonnet, which was um, through Fat Quarter Shop. And same thing here. I used the called for floss, but and the called for 25 count, but I stitched it over one instead of over two. So again, it finished super small and cute. Um, but I love, I do love how it turned out. Um, but it really was a ton of stitching. 
each of these houses was about 1,000 stitches. So it was really, it was pretty intense stitching. It really was. Um, this was also a little wooden plank I got from Target Dollar Days for $3. Whenever I see things like this, like um, the paddle boards or the like little, little platform boards in the Dollar Days spot, I snatch them up because they're always under $5 and I just tuck them away and eventually I find something that works perfect for finishing. I'm actually almost sure I got this basket from the dollar spot at Target as well. So just keep that in mind. I always go over and check um, for little things like that that I can use for finishing. So that was on June 5th that I finished that. On June 12th, I finished a chart maker's stitching, stitchers bag. Um, I showed all these in my last video, so they might look really familiar to some of you. <laughs> this was an old kit that I found at the thrift store. Um, it, I, I want to say the year was like 1994, maybe 97. Um, this is R&R &R linen. It came already sewn up into this pouch, and this is just DMC. So I finished that and then on June 14th, I finished a pattern of my own design. This is called Salty 24-7. This is on fabric I dyed myself and it's crystal fabric, so it's sparkly. And I stitched it with DMC Etoile in Blanc, basically just white sparkles. And um, this is called Salty 24-7, and this is my own design. I finished it in a frame I found at Michael's that I painted. It was, um, it was just a plain wood, so I painted it with some pearlescent acrylic paint. I love how this turned out. Um, after that, I finished my third and final house in my Nantucket series. So this is Christmas in Nantucket, the third house, and it's called Keats Street. And this is all DMC except for the houses stitched in Weeks Dye Works Dove. I think of the three, this is my favorite. I just love the widow's walk up at the top. And I like the house. I mean, I do like the house overall too, but I really love that widow's walk, which is a um, very prominent feature in Nantucket. Um, and then I sneak, I snuck in two more finishes before the end of June. So I, so pardon my reach. I finished Jeanette Douglas Take Time to Collect um, which was a tiny little pattern. I had barely anything started on it. This is on 36 count picture this plus oaken and all the called for silks and wools and fancy fibers. It's got some specialty stitches, especially down here, which I think turned out really well. Um, these are queen stitches, which are super fun. Um, satin stitch all around the border. The thimbles are over one. The little bird is over one. That was not fun. <laughs> I think it turned out really cute though. I haven't had a chance to fully finish it yet. I'm still trying to decide if I want to do, um, I mean, it'd be kind of cute in a tiny little frame, right? Look how lit, it's super little. Like it's tiny. It'd be pretty cute in a little frame. I think it would be really cute as a pillow. And I also think it would be really cute as a flat fold like these little guys. So I don't know yet what I'm gonna do. Stay tuned. And then my very last finish, um, which I snuck in on <laughs> June 27th, was um, a free little pattern from Jennifer, Whistle Stop Stitcher. 
if you go to her Instagram, she's got a link and she's, um, she started with this one, but she's now put up a bunch more. So this is a stitcher's place is in the resistance. And this is stitched on 40 count picture this plus Meyer, which I absolutely love. And it's stitched with a purple floss that I dyed myself. So those last two finishes, I haven't had a chance to fully finish yet, but those are all of my finishes for 2020 so far. So halfway through. So it's very exciting. All right. So now I want to talk about some books. So if you are not interested in the book talk, that's perfectly fine. And um, I hope I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Okay, let's talk about books. So like I said, so far this year, I have read 34 books. I am behind on my goal. So I, I have a Goodreads account, but all I do with it is just like, when I start a book, I mark it as a currently reading. And when I finish a book, I mark it as read. And then I give it a rating out of five stars maximum. Um, I don't write reviews. I don't do a whole lot else with Goodreads. I know some of you have asked if you can friend me on there and you totally can. That's fine. I'm not really exciting on there. I, I literally use it to track my books and that's about it. I know some people are, are more active in like the community function of that website, but I just, I, I haven't ever done it. So, um, so anyway, I set a goal this year to read 80 books, which is a lot. Um, but last year I read 76 books for the whole year. And so I just wanted to push myself to maybe do a few more. And I read 76 books books last year, but that was with me um, really reading way more than I had ever before. And what I mean by that is I was taking a book to work to read at lunch. Um, I was reading a lot in the evenings. And then I always, always read my Kindle before bed. So I really pushed myself last year. And I read 76 books. And I thought, I, I just reflected and I thought I could not really have read many more books if I had tried. And so I didn't want to push my goal too far. So I added four books and I pushed it to 80. I am not on pace for that goal. Um, Goodreads challenge says I'm about five books behind. I'm not surprised at all because I have certainly tapered down on my reading this year. Um, and that's okay. I'm okay with it. I'm, st I mean, I've still read 34 books, like give me a break. But, um, when the pandemic started, I thought, here we go. I am gonna read some books. I'm gonna read so much. And then I just didn't feel like it. Like mentally, I was really having trouble like focusing and concentrating. So I just, I, that didn't, what I thought was going to happen did not happen. Um, I stitched more, but I did not read more. So I am behind on my goal and that is fine. Maybe I'll make up the difference in the next six months. Maybe I'll continue to follow, fall behind. Maybe I'll finish 10 books off goal. It is what it is. Of the 34 books I have read in the last six months, I have given, I think it's 17 books. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, no, 15 books. I don't know where I got 17. I've given 15 books a five star rating on Goodreads. So I pulled the 15 books that I have loved the most this year. I've read more than 15 really, really good books. These were just the 15 that earned that five star review. There were, there were quite a few four stars that were really, really, really great that I would recommend, um, but didn't make this list. So, um, okay. So these are mostly in order, except I, um, I'm going to talk about two right now because they're part of a series. So I first, at, early in the year, I finally read A Darker Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab. So that was my first five-star rating of the year. 
a little, uh, another, maybe a month or so later, I read the second book in the series. So I'm just going to talk about both of them now because they both got five star ratings. The second book was A Gathering of Shadows. So these are by the Schwab. I don't have either of those books in my possession, but I do have the third book in the trilogy, um, which is called A Conjuring of Light. And again, by V.E. Schwab. So here are the, here's the trilogy. So I'm talking about the first two. I have yet to read the third because just kind of like, I always do this. Like if there's a trilogy, I read the first one and I usually read the second one pretty soon. And then I just kind of wait on the third, like, cause I don't want it to be over. <laughs> um, I do that a lot. So anyway, this is, um, so I read the first two. I, I rated them both five stars. This is an adult fantasy series. It is very difficult to explain, but it's very, very good. Um, I, <laughs> I don't even know how to describe this. Um, and also when I'm talking about these books, some of them I read five or six months ago. So things could be a little hazy. I don't always have the best recall on books. Um, so anyway, the, in this world, this fantasy world, um, there are several different, um, worlds that kind of layer on top of each other. And there are people who have magic who can walk between the worlds. Um, so there is a, one of the worlds would be based on like our world. Um, and it's set in our version of London. However, it's set maybe in the 1800s. So, um, pre industrial revolution, London. And then there are, um, alternate Londons, um, and think of it like the worlds all kind of like sit on top of each other. And there are people who can walk between them. Um, and some of the worlds, um, they don't call their London, London. They call it something else. But it's essentially London um, in geographical terms. So uh, anyway, there is magic um, that only some possess. And very, very, very few have the ability to walk between worlds. At some point in the past, something really, really terrible happened. And they basically banished, um, world walking. And so there are a few, very few people who are allowed to travel between worlds anymore. And they're only allowed to go from like one ruler to the ruler in the next world. And they just like are messengers. They just pass messages back and forth. One of the worlds had some magic that went really, really corrupt and it's, um, it's been closed off. And um, so part of this series is about what happened in that world, why is it closed off, um, and just power struggles of um, the, ma the people who have magic um, in a power struggle over dominion, over magic, and over the worlds. Um, the characters are really, really interesting. Um, and... I don't know. I, I, I don't know what else to say about it, but it's it was very intriguing. The magic system was really interesting and unique. The world building was very interesting. Um, fast plot, um, really funny. So I have really enjoyed this series. I'm sure I will love the third and final book in the series. Just, I don't know when I'm going to read it. Um, it's special and I'm just like kind of waiting. <laughs> Um, so a couple of books I don't have in my possession. Um, I read and loved The Bear and the Nightingale by Catherine Arden. I'll put a picture of the cover in now. So this is actually considered an adult um, historical fantasy, which is a a genre I don't know really exists, but that's how it was labeled when I looked it up. Um, it's not a young adult book, interestingly, but it features a, a protagonist who is a young adult. So to me, it felt like a young adult book, um, but it's not. It's an adult um, 
it is centered around a young girl who grow who we follow into young woman um her name is vazia and she has and it's set in uh russia essentially or a world based very closely on russia it has um old russian folklore um gods and folk characters so like a baba yaga and then a bunch of others um so vazia is um has a connection to this old the old gods um that most people have um, no longer have that connection the the old gods and the old folk customs have been um waning they've been waning as people are turning to christianity and um traditional religion and the old gods are losing like their power so it's kind of like them you know what was it like when we were kids that they were like you know if you don't believe in santa you know then he's not gonna come like um his magic is waning because people don't believe anymore so vazia um has this connection um and she kind of serves as this go-between and um there are some bad gods that want to use vazia for nefarious purposes um I just realized I'm talking way too much about these books. If I'm going to go through 15 of them, I've got to speed it up. So um, anyway, it is a fabulous book. I have literally never heard anyone say anything bad about this series. It is a trilogy. I still need to read the next two. Absolutely great. Um, the, the writing is beautiful. Just beautiful. Um, the culture and the world building is really beautiful as well. Okay, so then I read the third book in a trilogy. Oh my gosh, I finished a trilogy. <laughs> I read The Toll by Neil Schusterman, which is the third and final book in the Scythe trilogy. And I will drop a picture of the cover in here. Um, I loved this whole trilogy. All three books were absolutely fabulous. And the, um, the third book was a, for me, a very fulfilling conclusion. So this is a young adult series. It is um, set in a dystopian future. And um, the premise of the series is that um, mankind has figured out um, enough things about science that basically um, people have figured out how to live forever. And so um, they need some form of population control because nobody dies. And if you die, they revive you, they rejuvenate you. Um, so if that's allowed to happen, the population will obviously expand way beyond capacity for resources in our world. Um, so there is a group of um, ordained um, citizens who are called scythes and their job is to cull the population to go um, kill people and they have to stay dead. Um, if you are gleaned by a scythe you cannot be revived or rejuvenated like you are done. So um, this is, it's a very far-fetched premise. As you start the series, you're like, no way would we ever go, no way would we go for that. That would never happen. Um, accurate. However, once you get past that like initial, what the heck kind of feeling about this, this series, um, the world building is really detailed and really, really well done. And Neil Schusterman is a very good writer. His pacing is perfection. Um, so if you can just get past that that initial like disbelief, it's a really, really well written, well written series. Um, so I liked the conclusion. I'm still talking about these way too much. I'll try to be faster. Okay, um, so the next book I have that I don't physically have here um, that I gave five stars was a sequel. Um, it was The Night Country by Melissa Albert. It was the sequel to The Hazelwood. I'll drop in a picture here.
this is a young adult fantasy novel. Um, I really loved the first book a lot more than I thought I would. And I really, really loved the sequel. Um, I didn't expect it to be a five star read, but it was. Um, so the Night Country is loosely based on it, it's inspired by Alice in Wonderland. It's not a certainly not a direct retelling by any means. But there are a lot of you can definitely pick up the inspiration um, as you're reading it. Um, it is a magical um, fantasy, but it's like dark and twisty and um, unsettling. It's really good. I, I really, I hadn't read anything like it and I really enjoyed it and I was really taken aback and surprised by how much I liked it. Now that said, um, this book gets mixed reviews. And when I say this book, I mean the first one. I haven't heard as much about the sequel. Um, people either love it or hate it. Um, I think some people wanted like a happy fairy tale, fairy tale retelling and um, wanted like happy endings and you're not necessarily going to get that um, at all. So I think that might have been why some people didn't care for it. But it's written very well. Um, it's funny. It's sarcastic. It's just, just, it, I was feeling it. I was feeling it. Um, dark and twisty. Okay, now I have actual, the next run um, are going to be books I can actually show you. So this was kind of start of the pandemic that I really got into some of these. And um, I wasn't going, I couldn't go to the library and get books. So I started pulling books off these shelves and finally reading some books that I own. <laughs> so um I read the second book in a series um, by Jay Kristoff. It's the Nevernight Chronicles, which is a, a trilogy. And this was book two, which was God's Grave. I still need to read book three, which is called Dark Dawn. I haven't read that yet. Um, I love, love, loved Nevernight and I loved God's Grave. They were both five star reads for me. Um, this is adult fantasy, but it does, the protagonist is primarily, at least at the beginning of the series, she's a 16 year old girl. So it's definitely got some young adult crossover. I found these books filed with the young adult books at my used bookstore, but they're not young adult. Um, so anyway, Mia Corvair um, is a... Um, was a noble. Her family was brutally murdered and she is out for revenge. Um, she joins an assassin school to learn how to be like the best assassin ever. And then she is on a quest to get revenge on the people who killed her family. So book one is assassin school. Book two is the start of her quest. Um, in book two, Mia has this crazy twisty plan um, to get to the emperor who is her target um, for assassination. Um, and it involves her selling herself into slavery to become a gladiator, essentially, um, to get into the fighting pits and um, fight as a gladiator with the ultimate goal being that she'll make it to like the big gladiator competition where the emperor emperor will crown the winner. And that's like her chance to get like up close and personal and take them out. So book two, if you're into gladiator stuff, you will love this book. Um, but this trilogy is excellent. Um, hilarious writing style but really um, snarky, sarcastic, um, just right up my alley. And these books feature, this is a good point um, to make, these books feature footnotes um, really frequently. So you're reading along and then, you know, there'll be these footnotes and sometimes they are totally like not really relevant, um, but just funny little stories, funny little anecdotes, um, but um, very frequent entertaining footnotes and I say that because I do not recommend that you read these books on your Kindle. I really recommend a physical copy. Um, just much much easier to do. 
I am sure I will love the third book in this series whenever I finally read it. Um, okay, my next five star <laughs> review was Call Down the Hawk by Maggie Stiefvater. This is a trilogy. It's going to be a trilogy. Um, this is book one. So I absolutely love the Raven Cycle series by Maggie Stiefvater, which is four books. Um, I reread those and I finished that reread um, before the end of 2019. So um, one of the characters from the Raven Cycle, Ronan Lynch, got a spinoff series. I'm not surprised at all because Ronan's the best. And uh, many people like me um, are obsessed with Ronan and we're thrilled to get a trilogy series about Ronan. And when I say he's the best, he's actually the worst. Ronan is horrible. Um, but I love him so much. He's such a jerk, but I just love him so much. I can't quit him. Um, so this is, <laughs> we get a lot obviously more Ronan. Um, he's the main character in this series. Um, and we get a lot more of Ronan's family, his two brothers. And um, there's some new characters. And um, it starts a little slow, I will admit. I mean, I was still like super into it, super captivated. Um, but it does get off to a little bit of a slow start as she's building the world and introducing um, new people. And then the last third like really took off and got, you know, really fast paced and interesting. But what I love about Maggie Stiefvater is she writes characters like no other. Even the characters you don't like that you're not supposed to like are so fascinating. Like the bad guys in this book, the guys that are trying to kill everybody, um, they're not just like one dimensional villains like she gives them backstory and motives and really interesting qualities and um, they're just fa like fascinating character studies. She writes characters so so well and that is for me I think why I just love her and everything she writes. Um, so after that I read Sorcery of Thorns by Margaret Rogerson. So this was a surprise five star for me. I, ex this is young adult fantasy. I expected this to just be your run of the mill. Oh, sorry about the glare, the glare happening there. You can see it's a foil cover. Um, I expected this to be a really run of the mill young adult fantasy, like a three star, maybe a four star, you know, like it was entertaining. It was cute. It was fun forgettable. It's all good. I just did not expect to really love this book like I did. I got really wrapped up in it and um, I really loved it. Um, so it's uh, probably what hooked me immediately is it starts and is um, heavily set in a library. Uh, there is a um, there are these magical great libraries where grimoires, magical books, are kept for the safety of, of civilians. Some of them are extremely dangerous. Um, and um, Elizabeth, the main character, is training as an apprentice at the library. And she witnesses somebody breaking free a very dangerous grimoire. Um, she is blamed for it um, falsely and so basically she's trying to clear her name and she's trying to figure out who is unleashing these terribly dangerous books on her country. She has to team up with a, I think they call them mages, sorcerer, it's a sorcerer or a mage. Anyway, um, she has to team up with him, enemies to lovers, I really love this book. It, it really caught me by surprise. Um, the next book I read that I did expect to love, and I did, was Wicked Saints by Emily Duncan. This book is very mixed reviews as well. Um, it is a young adult fantasy. 
I absolutely loved this book. I loved the writing style. It is the author's first novel ever. She's a librarian in real life. Um, and so you, it did have a few of the flaws um, that I would expect in a debut novel. Like I think um, she's going to come into her own and become a much better writer. But there were a few like you know, she's a little green, um, but overall, I think she she wrote a really great book. Um, I don't know why it gets mixed reviews. I think um, there were a few parts that, you know, it could get a little bit confusing with, like, some of the crazy names, but um, I really loved the plot, the pacing, and I really loved the characters. This is an enemies to lovers, but also like, um, and I'm such a sucker for an enemies to lovers trope in a young adult fantasy. But what's really fascinating about this is, um, one of the bad guys, like the, that, um, is, a a love interest, like stays bad and he's like really bad. So it's kind of, it was a really fun new dynamic to like, um, be like, no, this is a bad guy. Why is she into him? And usually when that happens in a book, like the bad guy gets redeemed and you find out he's not that bad. And you know, he had all these extenuating circumstances. But in this book, like he's just bad and he stays bad. <laughs> and it ends with him still being bad. Um, but she, you know, there's this like chemistry between the main, the main character and the bad guy. So it was really fun to read for that reason, because you were like, no, girl, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> um, but really interesting premise. Um, what's the plot? I mean, it's so hard to explain. Um, but basically a girl who can speak with the gods, which is a extremely rare talent. So she's basically like a saint. Um, she can speak with the gods and then the neighboring country has um, blood magic and they don't have anything to do with the gods and the countries are at war and they both think like their way of magic is right and the other is an abomination. It's not just like they're a little intolerant, like they are out to like wipe out the other magic system. And it's about this girl coming to realize that maybe, um, maybe there could be a balance and how can she accomplish that? Um, it's dark, it's twisty, um, it's, it is really fun. I really liked it a lot and there is a sequel and I haven't read it yet. Okay, so I finally decided to read an adult book. You guys know I read a ton of young adult and a ton, a ton of young adult fantasy, right? I finally thought maybe I should read an adult novel. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Young adult fantasy is my jam but I read other things too. Um, so I was super excited for this book. Erin Morganson, Starless Sea. This is adult fantasy. Um, this book is absolutely phenomenal. Oh, it's so hard to describe. Um, it's definitely a book I need to reread. I think you will just pick up more things every time. Um, it's got like a dreamlike quality. Uh, after you finish it, your mind just keeps going like, but what? But what about the bees? Like, whatever happened to the bees? And you know, there's just like a lot to think about. It was still a very satisfying book. Um, but it, okay, how do I describe this book? <laughs> um, I'll just read a little bit of this, the little like teaser in the cover. So far beneath the surface of the earth, upon the shores of the starless sea, there is a labyrinthine collection of tunnels and rooms filled with stories. The entryways that lead to this sanctuary are often hidden, sometimes on forest floors, sometimes in private homes, sometimes in plain sight. But those who seek will find their doors have been waiting for them. So we find the main character, Zachary, finds a door and he enters this world with the starless sea. And um, basically it's a world full of stories, full of books. 
um, story keepers, a lot of magic, and um, there are various political powers at play. There are people in our world who want to shut down this world. There are people who want to open it to any and all. Um, and Zachary gets wrapped up in, in the middle of it. Um, it's basically this book is just a love note to people who love books. It was fabulous. It was so good. Um, there were a lot of things that you don't understand um, or don't quite grasp, but it, like I said, it has this dreamlike quality. Um, it's all kind of circular. It all kind of connects eventually. Uh, it's basically stories within stories within stories. If that sounds intriguing to you, I highly recommend this book. It's, um, but it will, it will leave you a little unsettled. It will leave you thinking. It's not gonna, it's not like wrapped up in a pretty bow. So after that, I read, I went back to my young adult. Um, I read Rainbow Rowell, Wayward Son. This is the second book, um, the sequel to Carry On, which was one of the absolute favorite books I read in 2019. So Carry On is um, inspired by Harry Potter. It started as, it, it's hard to explain. So this author, Rainbow Rowell, wrote a book called Fangirl, and it was a young adult contemporary novel about a young woman who loves fan fiction. She writes fan fiction, she reads fan fiction. Um, and in this world, this it, it's our world, but um, Rainbow Rowell couldn't use Harry Potter because of copyright and whatnot. So she created like her version of Harry Potter, which involves Simon Snow. Simon Snow is Harry Potter, essentially. Um, so Fangirl features um, a, a young woman who is wrapped up in fan fiction around Simon Snow. Apparently Rainbow Rowell was so inspired by this fictional world she had built that she finally was like, maybe I'll just write a Simon Snow book. And she did. Um, it is certainly influenced by Harry Potter, but definitely different. Um, and it is, it was absolutely delightful. Hilarious. Fascinating, amazing characters. Enemies to lovers, like times a hundred. Such a great book. So Wayward Son is the sequel to Carry On. Um, I can't say a lot about it without totally spoiling Carry On for people who might be interested in reading Carry On, but um, I highly recommend it. In Wayward Son, the uh, the trio, which is basically like Harry, Ron, and Hermione, like kind of, but you know, not really, because it's a different it's a different world. But um, Simon, Baz, and Penny go to America. There's a reason that they go. Um, they find themselves on a road trip across America from Chicago to California. They get into a lot of trouble. They go to a Renaissance festival, which is absolutely hysterical. <laughs> they drive across Nebraska and Rainbow Rowell is from Nebraska, but she just lights in to Nebraska and like how absolutely like abysmal it is to drive through. It's, it's so funny. I, it's funny to me because I'm from Kansas, which is right below Nebraska. So I was like feeling it when she's talking about cornfields and all that. Like I was like, yep. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyway, they get into hijinks. It ends on a little cliffhanger. There's going to be another book. Okay. So then I read, um, I did, this is a reread. So, um, Andrea, Stitchy Bookworm on Flosstube and on Instagram, um, we buddy read all the time. We actually buddy read Wayward Sun, Starless Sea, Sorcery of Thorns, Call Down the Hawk, God's Grave, <laughs> and other things probably. Those were just the ones that made my five-star list. So 
Andrea and I are almost always buddy reading something together. So she, um, she finally finished Lee Bardugo, um, Shadow and Bone trilogy, and she was ready to start the next, uh, series that ties into that world, which was Six of Crows, and then the second book is Crooked Kingdom. I've already read both of those books, um, but Andrea was reading them for the first time, and I was like, I've been meaning to reread those, like, I'm totally reading that with you. So we... I reread Six of Crows and she read it for the first time. It's a young adult fantasy novel. It held up so well. It was still so good. Honestly, I think it was better. And I already absolutely adored this book. Um, but on the reread, it was even better because I think the very first time I read it, I had a little bit of trouble keeping characters straight. Um, there were quite a lot of characters introduced and, um, some magic systems that tie into the trilogy Shadow and Bone. And I unfortunately had not read that um, before I read Six. I read Six of Crows not realizing there had been a trilogy um, that tied in. So I had since read that so I understood the world and the magic system much better. Made this book so much more enjoyable. I still absolutely loved it and you can read it without having read the trilogy. But um, this time I just understood the magic a lot better. And I understood the geography a lot better. There's a map in here, but you know, they talk about a lot of places and you're like, what? What, where, what? So this time I was able to really follow along a lot better and it just made it much more interesting. Anyway, this is everything. Enemies to lovers dark twisty pass um there's the the most fun part of these books is there's a heist um these are like um these are gang members who are like thieves <laughs> and criminals but lovable lovable thieves and criminals you root for them you want them to succeed they all have like a a sad backstory of why they became a thief and a criminal but um you know, and they're out to get like, they're out to topple like the patriarchy, you know. Um, anyway, <laughs> the characters are so fascinating, so well written. The other thing I love about this series is the diversity. There are people from all nationalities. Now, these are, it's a made up world, but like, it's very clearly like, um, there are characters who are like an Asian influence. There are characters who are um, a black influence. There is Indian, Middle Eastern. So like all, all the colors, the people are all the colors. And there are all the like sexual orientations too. So we've got straight, bi, gay, like all the things. So um, I just, I love the diversity and I love the representation in this book, but that's never like the, you know, it's, it's its own like fascinating book without that. That's just like a little part of these characters who are so fascinating and have been through so much. Um, so there's, um, there's also like a lot of, um, trauma in the past in the, in most of the characters. Uh, so it's interesting to see that navigated as well. But essentially, it's a heist story. They're going to try to break out a political prisoner from a heavily guarded um, prison in the neighboring country. And um, this unlikely band has to team up. And um, there are enemies within the, the team. And um, it's about them trying to figure out how they're going to overcome that. Um, work together to ultimately get their own goal, you know, succeed at their goal. Some of them have magic. A lot of them don't. A lot of them are not magical at all. They're just awesome. It has some of the best characters. Like I'm just obsessed with all of them. If you have, everybody raves about this series, like everybody, but if you have not read it, I highly recommend highly recommend. All right, we're almost done. Just three more books. I don't know how long this is, but 
you know how I get when I start talking about books. Um, so I very recently read Tomi Adiyami, Children of Blood and Bone. I just talked about this in my last video. Um, this book was so great. Young adult fantasy. What are 95% of these books are young adult fantasy. Um, so this book is set, of course, in a fictional world, but it is modeled around Africa and countries in Africa. So um, it features people of color, but some of them have magic. And the, the, the citizens who have magic have this white hair. And um, there are non-magical folk, of course, who are very jealous of the magical capabilities of the magi. They're called magi, the people who have magic. Um, so essentially the king of this country figures out a way to cut off the source of magic for the magi and he does so and so now it's been like 11 or 12 years that nobody has magic and he's hunting down imprisoning enslaving oppressing these easily recognizable white haired magi um so there is a character named zeely who is featured on the cover and she descends from a line of, of magical people, um, but she's never got, gotten to experience magic herself because um, most of them, their magic awakens like at puberty. And um, magic was taken away when she was very, very little, like age four or five, something like that. So her mother had it, she saw her mother do it, but she's never been able to do it. Um, so anyway, she is essentially thrust into a quest to reawaken magic, to thwart the king and bring magic back to these special people. Um, she forms some unlikely partnerships, um, chaos ensues, things don't go as planned. Um, the book ends with I this is a spoiler but are you surprised she brings magic back at the end but but <laughs> it's not quite as she thought it would be so ends on a little bit of a cliffhanger where you're like what what oh what and there's a sequel and I am reading it right now and it's really good so far um but I loved this book beautiful beautiful world building gorgeous like descriptions the characters are really nuanced um a lot of angst and I'm such a sucker for angst um all of the characters are torn and conflicted and angsty so it was really good and then I read the only book that's not fantasy on this list I mean you can tell what I like um, this is a contemporary young adult, not fantasy at all. This is real life. Um, so Angie Thomas, The Hate You Give. I think while this video is uploading, I'm going to go watch the movie, um, which is on Netflix. So this book features a 16-year-old girl named Star. And her, um, at the very beginning of the book, she is getting a ride home from a friend, a black man. Um, I think he's like 16 or 17 he's he's her, her age um and they get pulled over by a cop we never find out why he doesn't tell them um when they're pulled over um her friend Khalil is like well, why did you pull me over and the cop never really explains um but anyway things um during this routine traffic stop things escalate and Khalil is shot and killed by the cop so um the rest of the book is kind of the fallout and the aftermath the community is protesting um khalil wasn't armed khalil didn't do anything um threatening why was he shot and killed why was he even pulled over um and star being the witness is kind of conflicted and torn on whether she should speak out um 
she knows she should and she wants to and she knows that Khalil deserves that but she's scared to death um, of what will happen um, if she takes on the the police and if she goes to court over this and um, this book was written in 2017 but it's still sadly extremely relevant to current events um, I highly recommend this book and highly encourage everybody to read it to get a look into what it's like um, right now to be in the shoes of a black person in America. This story feels to me very authentic. I am not a black person in America, but it felt so believable. Like everything that happens, I was like, that has happened. That happens every day. That still happens. Like it's not made up. Like this is real life. Um, everything feels very immediate and very real. It's a hard book. It hits really hard, but I think it's really important and it's written really, 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 really well. And um, it's a lot to think about. There's a lot to chew on. Um, and I just think it's important. I think people need to read it. Um, hopefully, could help some people understand what is going on in our country right now. Um, if you, I mean, a lot of people do understand. I already pretty much understood and I still learned something from this book. But if you're one of those people that's like, I don't really get Black Lives Matter. Like, I don't, I don't see it. Like, what is it all about? Like, this could be a good starting point for you to kind of see what it's like to be black in America right now. I think I think it could be a little eye-opening for some people. Highly recommend. It was absolutely phenomenal. The last book I'm going to talk about, I'll have to drop a picture in because I read it on my Kindle, um, by one of my all-time top three probably authors, Toni Morrison. I read Song of Solomon. Here's a picture of the cover. Um, I just talked about this on my last video as well. Um, it, this book is primarily set in the 1960s, right before the civil rights movement. It's on the, the cusp of the civil rights movement. It's on the, the eve of big changes happening. So there's a lot of um, unsettling uh there's an unsettled feeling like things are starting to boil, but they haven't happened yet. It's like that gasp right before things like explode. So um, obviously a lot of um, exploration into race in America. Um, the protagonist is a black man, but he is a more privileged black man in that he has wealth. Um, he, he, his family has wealth and he has benefited from that. Um, and he's really having trouble figuring out where he fits in because he doesn't feel like he fits in with the black society in his town, but he certainly doesn't fit in anywhere else. Um, and so he is on a journey to find himself basically, um, Again, I, I just talked about this and I talked about it for a long time in my last video, but um, Toni Morrison is, for me, one of the best American authors of all time. Um, we sadly lost her last year, but um, everything I've read, I do still have a couple of books of hers I haven't read, um, but every book I've read of hers has been just so, so, so good. She is a beautiful writer, but also um, writes characters in, in such a fascinating way. Um, always, always multiple themes that she's exploring in her books. And, um, layer upon layer upon layer. A lot of her books, um, things circle back in surprising ways later. 
she's just such a great writer. Uh, Song of Solomon, as I expected, was, of course, absolutely phenomenal. Five star read. So um, those are my five star reads for the mid-year point. So we will see what happens in the latter part of the year. I would um, hopefully be back to do an update at the end of the year, show you guys more stitching finishes and talk to you more about what I've read in 2020. So thanks for watching if you made it this far. I know that I can get really rambly when I start talking about books and I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.